Professor Tracy back with another video for Law Simply Explain. This one on promissory estoppel. So the last few lessons have been on the doctrine of consideration, but this lesson considers the first of what are termed consideration substitutes. So in the absence of consideration, if we have then a gratuitous promise, is there any way for us to enforce that promise? And the answer is yes, and this is one of the doctrines that we can use to do that. So this is promissory estoppel. And in this lesson, we're going to consider three different things. We're gonna look back, do a little bit of review, look at the elements of promissory estoppel, and then look at some examples, and really one primary example to see how it works in practice. So remember where we have been, we've considered what is a promise and we said that we use the objective theory of contracts so that when we're considering whether someone has made an actual commitment to act or not act in a specified way, we're looking at their manifestation, their outward expression, and saying, how would a reasonable person view that? And we're giving that manifestation its ordinary meaning, giving the technical meaning to any technical terms that are used, and considering all the surrounding circumstances and asking, would a reasonable person think that that manifestation was a commitment from that person to act or not act in a specified way? But we said that once we have a promise, we need to categorize those promises as either being contractual in nature or gratuitous. And we've spent the last several lessons looking at contractual promises, meaning they are part of an exchange. They are contractual in nature and therefore we can seek a legal remedy to enforce that promise, meaning we can run into court and enforce the promise legally if the promisor fails to do what it is they committed to do. And we said that to know for sure if a promise is contractual, we need to look at the elements of formation, which are offer, acceptance, and consideration. And our focus has been on that last element of consideration. And so we have been looking at and saying, well, that promise needs to be part of a bargain for exchange of something of legal value, meaning that the promisor is making the promise to the promisee with the expectation of getting something in return. So they're motivated to make the promise because they're seeking a detriment back from the promisee. And we said that it's typically either going to be a return promise in the case of a bilateral contract or a, a unilateral contract where what's coming back to the promisor is a return performance. And we'll look at those terms in more detail in a future lesson. The focus right now in this lesson is on gratuitous promises. And so we've still got a promise and but this one is gratuitous, meaning that there is nothing coming back the other way. There is no consideration. And we said ordinarily those promises are not legally enforceable, but there are exceptions. And we've looked at some of those and we're going to remind ourselves of what those are. So remember, we previously looked and said that a gratuitous promise for a gift, once that gift has been executed, then that gift can't be gotten back, right? The promisor can't come forward and say, well, when I made the promise of a gift, it was gratuitous, therefore give it back. No, once the gift has been executed, that's done. The fact that the initial promise of the gift was gratuitous is now irrelevant. And then we said there are some very particular situations where a gratuitous promise by law has been made enforceable. So we said a promise to pay a, a debt barred by the statute of limitations is legally enforceable despite the fact that there would be no new consideration. Similarly, with a promise to pay a debt discharged in bankruptcy, and similarly with a promise 
that is coming from someone who used to be a minor, reached the age of majority, and they're now promising or affirming that they will pay that obligation that they incurred as a minor. As we'll see in a future lesson, that, that a, uh, a contract or a, a promise that is made by a minor is typically one that can be disaffirmed, meaning that the minor can get rid of it. But if they're affirming that once they each reach the age of majority, that would be a situation where they're not getting anything new in return, but yet by operation of law, that promise is enforceable. So another exception would be promissory estoppel. That's what we're looking at today. Then restitution, which we'll look at in the next lesson along with promissory restitution. So our focus is on that one titled promissory estoppel. So let's look at the elements of promissory estoppel. Our general definition is there. It's, it's quite lengthy, but it's from the restatement section 90. And it says that a promise which the promisor should reasonably expect to induce action or forbearance on the part of the promisee or a third person and which does induce such action or forbearance is binding if injustice can be avoided only by enforcement of the promise. The remedy granted for breach may be limited as justice requires. So there's a lot there. So we know that we've got to break it into elements. We need to chunk it. So let's look at those elements and we can divide it into five. The first is a promise. The definition of a promise here is going to be what we've been using, which is we need that manifestation of an intent to act or not act in a specified way and that that manifestation is so made as to justify the promisee, the person to whom the promise was made, as understanding that a commitment has been made. And we just talked about, we view that as being objectively true, right? We're using the objective theory of contracts and we're saying, would it, would, is it reasonable for that manifestation to be viewed as making a commitment? So we said that the promise, when we're looking at a manifestation, it could be spoken word or written word, but it could also be implied by conduct. But regardless, it must be clear, definite, and unambiguous as to its essential terms. Then when we're looking at our second element of promissory estoppel, once we've got a promise coming from the promisor to the promisee, we're now asking when the promisor made that promise, do they have a reasonable expectation that the promisee is going to receive that promise and then take action on it? Either that they will do something in response to that promise or not do something, forbear, meaning they're not going to act as a result of that promise. So we're asking, is it, a, do they have that reasonable expectation? And reasonable, like we've used it in other contexts, means in light of all the surrounding circumstances, is that something they would expect? In other words, there, there's lots of reasons, but a good example would be, are they going to hear that and it's being made as a joke and it's obviously a joke? So no, there would be no expectation that the promisee would in fact hear that promise, which is obviously a joke, and then act or not act in response to it. So we've looked at it from the promisor's perspective and said, if they've made the promise, do they reasonably expect or foresee the promisee to rely on that promise? And now we're saying, well, did the promisee rely on that promise? And we use the but for test, which comes from other contexts as well, such as torts or criminal law. But here we're saying, is it true that but for the promisor's promise, would the promisee have not acted or forborne their action uh, in, the, in this particular case? 
So we're using the but for test to find reliance because if it's not the promise which motivated the promisee to act or to not act, then it's not clear there's been actual reliance on that. Now, one thing I want to note right here is when we're thinking about reliance and we're thinking about the previous element, when we said, is there a reasonable expectation? One thing to keep in mind is if the actions of the promisee, the person to whom the promise was made, are unreasonable, that they're acting in a way that is not reasonable given all the surrounding circumstances, then that's a situation where we would say, well, it's not likely that the promisor would foresee the promisee reacting in that way. So that goes back to the other element, but it also ties into this element of reliance. So, so far we've got the promise, We've got a reasonable expectation that the promisor has, that the promisee will rely on that. There's actual reliance. We can say, but for the promise, the promisee would not have relied on it. And now we're asking, does justice require enforcement of the promise? And when we're asking this, we're asking, did the promisee suffer a detriment as a result of relying on this promise? And you'll often hear people describe promissory estoppel kind of in shorthand by saying it's about detrimental reliance. That detriment in this case means harm. Were they harmed by relying on the promise? So we're using detriment in, an, in a slightly different way than we would use it in the context of consideration, where if you've read a case like Hamer versus Sidway, you know that detriment in the context of consideration doesn't mean it has to be harmful for the promisee. It could in fact be beneficial for them. We mean detrimental in the sense that they are incurring some sort of obligation that they didn't have before, or they are waiving some legal right they had before that they could have exercised. But in the context of promissory estoppel, we're saying, were they harmed by relying on it? And so for there to be an enforcement of a gratuitous promise through the use of promissory estoppel, it must be the case that the promisee suffered some sort of detriment, that they were harmed by the reliance on the promise. And if that's the case, we would say, well, then justice requires the enforcement. And that brings us to the final element of, well, what's the remedy for promissory estoppel? And this is one where we have to be careful because the normal remedy in contracts would be expectation damages, meaning that the party that's been harmed will seek money damages asking the court to put them where they expected to be if everything had gone as the parties had promised. So we call that expectation damages, saying, put me where I expected to be monetarily if everything went as expected by the parties. And that's one possibility. We would call that the full value of the promise. And it's possible that a court could say, even though the, the cause of action here is promissory estoppel, a court could say, nonetheless, the remedy we're giving the promisee in this case is still going to be expectation damages. But section 90 of the restatement says that the remedy may be limited as justice requires. And that limitation typically means it would be limited to reliance damages. Reliance damages are giving the promisee, remember, who's reasonably relied on the promisor's promise to their detriment, to their harm, we would say, let's give them their out-of-pocket expenses, what it is they expended in reliance on the promise so as to put them back to where they were before they detrimentally, harmfully relied on the promisor's promise. So that is often less than what expectation damages would be. So section 90 says that 
a court could limit the remedy as justice requires. And one reason to do that is if the feeling is that expectation damages may overcompensate the promisor in this context. Remember that the predicate here is that this is a gratuitous promise. And typically, promissory estoppel will be a fallback argument. You're going to want to look first and say, well, is there consideration? Can the promisee argue that the promise is contractual in nature and therefore establish the existence of a contract? And then if not, fall back to an argument like promissory estoppel or, as we'll see in the next couple lessons, restitution or promissory restitution. So this is a fallback. So let's do a quick recap of these elements. Remember that the promisor must have made a promise as we've defined it throughout our coverage of contracts that the promisor must have a reasonable expectation. They must foresee that the promisee will rely on this by either acting or failing to act in response to the promise. And indeed, there has to be actual reliance. And we said we find reliance using the but for test. Can we say, but for the promisor's promise, would the promisee have acted or not acted the way they did? And we said that that reliance must have been detrimental such that we can say in equity, in fairness, justice requires enforcement of this promise. And if all four of those are met, then we're going to look at this last part and say, what's the remedy? And we said that the remedy could be the full value of the promise, meaning expectation damages, but it could be simply reliance damages, which are typically more limited. They are only the money expended in reliance on that promise by the promisee. So those are the elements. Now let's look at some examples here. So we've got Bob writing a letter to Bo. Dear Bo, hope school's finishing up well for you. If you stay in Naples this summer, you may stay at my house for free. Very truly, Professor Bob. So what we have here is a promise from Bob that Bo can stay for free at his house if he's going to be sticking around Naples, Florida for the summer. So Bose received the letter, he's reading it. If you stay, if you stay in Naples this summer, you may stay at my house for free. Very truly, Professor Bob. So, Bo, we'd love for you to stay up with us this summer at Pains and Fears and LLP in Newark, New Jersey. Mr. Payne, I'm very grateful for your offer, but I've decided to stay in Naples this summer. I have an offer for free housing that's just too good to pass up. Hey, Professor Bob, I got your letter. Um, yeah, hi, Bo. Once I got your letter, I took a job in Naples for the summer. Well, about that letter... No, 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 Bob. No about that letter. What does that mean? Oh, hi, Bo. I didn't expect to see you here. Bob, what's going on? Why is Herman at your house? Come on, Bo. I didn't hear from you. What was I supposed to think? I gave my extra room to Herman. I'm sorry. No, Bob, you can't do that. I gave up in a job in Newark because you promised me. Bo, Newark, really hard choice, right? Florida or New Jersey? Maybe you should have paid better attention in contracts class. We don't have a contract. I can do what I want. Really? That's how you're going to be? What about fairness? What about following through on your word? I'm sorry, Bo. You've got to find somewhere else to stay this summer. Accept it and move on. I thought you were a friend. True friends stab you in the front, not the back, Bob. So 
look analyzing this, remember that Bob wrote a letter to Bo making a gratuitous promise. Remember that he's making he made the promise saying you can stay at my house for free this summer if you stay in Naples for the summer. So there's a condition on there, but it's just a conditional gift, right? Which is if you're going to stick around this summer, then feel free to stay at my house. And so that was a condition that was within the control of the promisee, Bo. But remember, that's not consideration. That decision to stay there is not consideration. So it induced, because Bob's promise induced a detriment from Bo, but it wouldn't count as consideration because there's no evidence that that's what motivated Bob to make the promise, that he really wanted Bo to stick around in Naples, Florida, so that he could stay with Bob, that he could have him stay there. There's no evidence that that was the case. So we would say it's gratuitous. It's not part of a bargain for exchange of something of legal value. So if we're looking and saying, what was Bo giving? Nothing. There was no return. Even if there was a detriment, whatever that detriment was, which was sticking around, wouldn't have constituted consideration. So we have to look and say, now for a fallback, and the one we're focused on in this lesson is promissory estoppel. So here we can look and say, well, are the elements of promissory estoppel met? And the answer is likely yes, right? Because Bob made a promise to Bo. It meets the definition of a promise. It's a manifestation of an intention to act in a particular way. And it was so made as to justify the promise Bob in understanding that, or Bo, uh, in Bo understanding that Bob had made a commitment to him. And we, the, the manifestation was an outward expression. It was, it was written word. It was a letter. And if we give it its ordinary meaning, give those words their ordinary meaning, there was no technical words used. And we look at all the surrounding circumstance of uh, Bob being Bo's professor and knowing that Bo was trying to decide where he was going to work for the summer and that he might stick around in Naples and therefore work locally if he was promised this housing, it appears reasonable to say that a commitment was made. But remember, it was gratuitous. And we have to ask, did Bob have a reasonable expectation that Bo might rely on it? Yes, absolutely, right? In fact, that's why he made it. He expected that he would rely on it. Not that that was what motivated him to make it, but he was trying to be kind. And he certainly knew or expected that Bo might make a decision to not seek housing elsewhere or to stay in Naples in and to take him up on the offer of free housing. And then did Bo rely on it? He did. Now we can debate the merits of whether he handled it as well as he should have as far as communicating with Bob, but he certainly relied on it and end up being harmful to him in the sense that he relied on it. He turned down the job at pain and fears and he was assuming he had this free housing and now he's in a situation where he turned down that job, took a job in Naples and has no housing. So it's been harmful to him. And we can say, remember, can we say, but for the offer of free housing, would he uh, have stayed? The answer appears to be no, right? Because reliance, we said we measured by the but for test. And here it appears that the answer is no. We, we heard his phone call with the firm and, and newer. So it appears that there was reliance on Bo's part and that it was detrimental, as I just explained, that he was harmed by it. And we don't know what the remedy might be here, but it's either going to be the full value of the promise, so housing, the value of housing, or reliance, whatever he expends in reliance on this promise made by Bob. So it appears that it would work. So even though there we have an absence of consideration, there is this idea of reliance or a bridge, right? That he's put weight on it, on this promise, and therefore 
he can argue that there's been detrimental reliance, the elements of promissory estoppel are met, and although the promise is gratuitous, that in equity, in fairness, the court should enforce it using the doctrine of promissory estoppel. So the idea of estoppel being that in equity, Bob should not be able to claim that the promise is merely gratuitous and unenforceable, but instead he should be stopped and forced to honor that promise. So there, that's what's happened is Bo relied on it. I've got a bad feeling about this. So one week later, guys, there's one Frappuccino left. I'm taking it. You have to make up for kicking me out of the house. You'll never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. So that's it. It's somewhat of a shorter lesson, but the doctrine of promissory estoppel is somewhat straightforward. I encourage you to find problems, at, whether those be short answer essay or multiple choice, to practice applying it so that you can see how it'll work in application. So as always, I appreciate you watching the video. I hope it was helpful. Please like and subscribe and I will be sure to put more free flashcards out in all the videos. There should be a link at the bottom to flashcards that you can use to reinforce your knowledge of the rules. Uh, best of luck as you study and you prepare. If you've got midterms coming up, those will be coming in the next few weeks. So I uh, hope that's helpful. See you again soon.